Recently, I was told a borderline blasphemous statement. I was told that Ein's Ulgaun from Overlord is a generic, piss poor, sorry excuse for an overpowered isekai protagonist. And as a connoisseur of overpowered characters and of terrible isekai anime, they came forth to me with this unbridled bad take. And I have to set the record straight, not just for myself, not just for them, but for the people. On the surface level, Overlord seems like an anime that definitely has that bad take. But if you actually watch the story and you actually embrace it for what it is, you will learn that, oh, how wrong of a take that is. The basic plot premise for the story Overlord is, well, I would go as far as to say, pretty basic as far as isekai anime go. You have your dude who's this overpowered character in some video game he's been playing and all of a sudden, oopsies, there was a glitch. He's stuck in the alternate world as his freaking alter ego who happens to be overpowered and all the NPCs develop Brooklyn accents somehow and become incredibly infatuated with him. And all of a sudden he's a menace to the world and he's an incredibly overpowered deity type being who's just spreading his influence further and further. Like I spread my imaginary girlfriend's legs when I continue my imaginary conquest. One of these days it will happen. I know. I, I am mentally prepared for that one day that I'm not critically and cripplingly depressed and alone. Shout out to lonely people who don't get enough love in this world. Let's go, baby. This one's for you, lonely people. Now, on the surface level, this definitely does look like your generic isekai story, where it's gonna kind of look like your power fantasy, where you can imagine yourself in the bones of Ein Zul Gaon, this incredibly badass-looking edgelord dude with all the magic powers in the world that's incredibly overpowered in every conceivable way, that this dude doesn't see almost anything as a threat to him. His biggest fear is that maybe at some point there will be someone else that is also trapped in the world that might reach a fraction of his power. And he's like, oh shit, what if that? That happens. I'm gonna try not to do spoilery things for Overlord because I do believe it's a great show and you should definitely watch it if you like this genre, but the main purpose of what I want to talk about here is how Ein Gown is so, so much more than your generic overpowered main character of an isekai story. He looks like a self-insert, but he isn't really. And being that I am the overpowered done right guy and I'm the shitty isekai guy <laughs> and I'm the Velma guy now because my fan base is evil and they forced me to binge the entire Velma show. God damn, I will never forgive you. It falls upon me to clean the name of the boy, the bone daddy, the big fucking boner man. The first and most noticeable aspect of Einzugul's character is his character design, and unlike every other self-insert isekai overpowered main character who manages to get a harem of people that love him and all that stuff, you'll notice right away, this dude don't look like your average brown-haired, black-eyed isekai protagonist that wields a sword and is cool. He's this wimpy-looking high school-ass kid that you could kind of self-insert yourself into. He is this incredibly terrifying force, this creature without even flesh man don't even got a penis and you're supposed to relate to this man he is scary as hell and that is an incredibly important distinction to make between him and other isekai protagonists because unlike the entirety of the genre that he inhabits Einzul Gaon is not only a character that you could be like, oh my god, he could just be like me, for real, for real. I could also be top level in a video game because I'm a sweaty nerd in the comment section of some VTuber guy who gets blasted on Twitter every day for being just a little bit too cringe. And I could also be sweaty and playing a video game and trapped in a video game and get a harem of, of women that, that want to throw their breasts at me like I'm a freaking basketball hoop. If that's what women do with breasts, I wouldn't know. One of these days, I'm telling you, it'll happen. And when it does, the power dynamic between us will shift vastly. But the point is, while Ein's Ulgaon does feel like you can self-insert into his character, into this world, by how he got there to some degree, Ein's Ulgaon is also in a very interesting place because as this undead lich lord guy, he is grappling with the lack of humanity that he actually has. Being that he is now trapped in this game as Ein Ulgaon, instead of simply as someone playing an undead lich, he is feeling a lot of these emotions and a lot of these mindset changes that this character would actually have. The reason why he doesn't look like your average twink isekai protagonist is because a large portion of this story is Ein Ulgaon grappling with his own humanity or lack thereof. 
maintaining the same ethics and the same morals as the person that's been playing him for all these years, but without necessarily having the same human core that he always did have. He has to grapple with how his very physiology has changed in this world and how that would affect his ethical or moral standpoints in regards to his subjugation of surrounding territories. So even yes, even though he checks the boxes of your overpowered isekai main character, he isn't just a bland self-insert, he's someone who's actively trying to find out who he is at the current time. <coughs> Editor cut that terrible coughing fit out. Because he is trying to find who he is. The antithesis of a self-insert character. And he manages to toe this line of, he could just be like me for real for real, and an existentialist crisis walking around every single day. Now, in the first arc of Overlord, the Undead King arc, we are mostly looking at the story from his perspective, just kind of trying to understand and fathom a new reality that he is living in, where he's trapped in this game world, Iguderasiru, that he's been playing for the last however many years, clocking however many hours. Because, yes, even though you're an incredibly badass player in this world while you are a player in the real world, Suddenly, you're not role-playing anymore. This is who you are! And he has to all of a sudden front that responsibility and maintain his place as the overlord of a world that he only understood on the most surface of levels as a player, not from an actual standpoint of the world's inhabitants. And might I just add that this is also an incredibly different dynamic than the main character trying to learn about his world. When you look at your average isekai anime, dude gets sucked into another world, he's overpowered and stuff, he knows nothing about the world. It's a completely new world to him. And as he slowly but surely grows his influence, his power grows, his army grows, his harem grows, all sorts of things grow, mostly his penis and mine, we start to learn more and more about what's been going on in the world, the different political factions that might be fighting with each other and all that fun jazz. Overlord, we know the basic premise of the world, or at least you know, Ainz Ulgaon does as like a top player, he just doesn't really understand the little details. He doesn't understand how it is to live life as one of the little people in this world. And you'll notice the focus of this world isn't necessarily the perspective of the main character trying to learn about the world as much as it is about how the world is affected by this main character suddenly imposing himself in the lives of everyone. I love this style of writing an overpowered character. Because it's not like we're trying to acknowledge the fact that this guy is overpowered and we're gonna prove that by all of a sudden he has this person who walks up to him and thinks he can defeat him and well, oh, nope, he didn't actually defeat him. It, it, I will be the triumphant one here. Where slowly but surely his power and influence continues advancing in this completely unknown world, I really like how this is about how Ein's Ul Gown is affecting the world instead of how the world is throwing things at Ein Zul Gown. We immediately find out that Ein Zul Gown is an incredibly powerful character. In this very same arc, he shows up at this village, and, and the village is, you know, all these people are out there, they're scared, they're being attacked by the, this religious order of cringe fighters, and they summon this level 9 angel, which is like this incredibly powerful spell that it takes like 4 billion people to cast, because holy shit, it's a level 9 angel, this is gonna be insane, and Ein Zul Gown just black holes it in a, in a freaking second, crushes it into nothing, like it's absolutely no threat in the world. We are immediately, immediately welcomed by the cold embrace of an overpowered main character, and yes, it is incredibly badass, don't get me wrong, and of course you get the really cathartic moments of all the cringe assholes wearing their KKK outfits just sitting there shaking, being like, you shouldn't have been able to do that on your own, and he can reveal himself as the legendary Ein's Gown. Yes, you have all those really epic cathartic moments that, let's be real here, we all love that shit. But it's so much more than that because Ein's Ul Gaon is scared. While he does know that this is a world that he is at the peak, he doesn't know if there are other people in this world. How they could affect him is his actual mortality in danger in this world. This is a world that, yes, Ein's Ul Gaon is incredibly familiar with because, well, he was the top player, but also it is a new world because he is now stuck in this world. And who knows who else is stuck in this world? Who knows the ramifications and consequences that would take place if something happens to him while he is stuck in this world? Suddenly, this world has become a new, new place, just skinned over by what it used to be.
Now, I think the writers very clearly knew exactly what they were doing when they made Overlord have this setting and this dynamic. They immediately knew that Ein Zulgaon was a character of such power and tremblingness that, yes, they definitely needed to give him his epic badass moments where he completely one-ups himself in a previous arc, but they had to also do it sparingly. They had to make him an actual threat, but there actually needed to be a threat towards him. And also, they needed to make sure that the perspective wasn't only his and his alone, because that would make for a very boring self-insert story. That would make for a generic isekai character, this dude who's trapped in a world, completely overpowered, surrounded by weaklings that he could just flex on them constantly. So slowly but surely, the job done and taken upon themselves by the writing team, the absolute legends over there that put this light novel together, they decided we are going to devote almost all of our attention on every character that is not Ein's Ul Gaon. Everything will be related back to him. Everything will have him as the main character and the forefront of every arc. However, it will almost always not be from his perspective alone. And thus begins the Dark Warrior arc. In the Dark Warrior arc, Ein's Ul Gaon and one of his maids, not even one of his generals, one of his maids, Neiberal Gamma, join him on this epic journey where they basically dress up as human adventure people to try to get a feel for the land from the perspective of humans, just kind of to increase his influence further, to make a little bit of money, to see what they're struggling with, to see what is going on in this world, not from the precipice of his throne and empire, but from the eyes of a layman. And this is another thing I love about Ein Zulgaon. Immediately, throwing you into this arc, you have a dynamic where Ein Zulgaon is really information gathering. He is really on that intel grind. Yes, he's the most overpowered being that we've ever seen. And yes, he's not realistically all that scared, but he is all that cautious. He must know, he must see it with his own eyes, and he must develop his own sense and his own level of priorities as to what is actually important in this world. Right now in his journey, he is a Joni ninja in the world of Genin ninja. This man does not have all that much to fear. He is one of the uh, metaphorical four emperors of One Piece when he's going up against the little peewee pirates that you find in the East Blue in the first arc. It's not necessarily going to be an actual challenge to him, but at some point, something or someone will, and he needs to get the jump on them when that happens. Not to mention that this is just even goofier, because he's using the role-playing skills that he's developed as a person role-playing an overlord, but this time he is an overlord role-playing an adventure. It's just cute. It's kooky. I like it. What could I say? In this arc, we start to understand a little bit more about the level of difference in power between him and his adversaries. And the massive finale of this arc, when they're saving this whole village that's getting poisoned and all that shit, and Nabral Gama, one of his maids, is going up against some legendary summoned dragon and wins one-on-one. -on -one. That's right. The maid is stronger than this ultra giga threat. And here you got our bro Ein Zul Gaon going up against one of the strongest sword ladies in the world, and goddamn, I would let her sit on my face. And obviously she could do nothing to him, and he crushes the life out of her. He is a mage, and he decides, no, I'm going to kill her purely by crushing her in a devastating hug. God, I wish someone would hug me like that. So while this arc definitely does establish and maintain a hierarchy when it comes to power levels, all right, Ein Zul Gaon is a completely other level to everything around him. Even his maid, not one of his generals, is a level above everything around him. We know that he is something unfathomable. Yet despite that, we have spent so much time fleshing out the world, fleshing out the e economy and economics of the different human guilds and how they operate, how different people are willing to take advantage of them and all that stuff. You start to realize that Overlord is the story of a king a king trying to understand his people, and his people who have not yet accepted him as their rightful and forever ruler. It is not the story of your little guy who's going to become stronger and become the pirate king Hokage, the uh, king of the freaking wizards. Uh, he, he's not your shonen protagonist coming out there. He is a benevolent and rightful ruler that you will be lucky to sit on your knees and lick his balls if he so dares have you brazenly gracing his presence. It's a story struggling against himself and struggling to understand the lesser people. It is not a power fantasy as much as it's a tyrannical drama. But don't get me wrong, 
there's a lot of power fantasy elements. The next arc right after this is the Bloody Valkyrie arc, and it's the final arc in the first season of the anime. It is great. We start to learn a lot about Shaltir Bloodfallen, one of the actual generals of Einzulgaon, how she actually rebels against him because she's poisoned by some artifact, and you start to learn a lot more about the world and a lot more about exactly how powerful these generals are, and a potential super threat that could genuinely maybe even kill Ainz! Who knows? These artifacts, these weapons that other human players have actually utilized, clearly painting a pathway to his potential demise, an actual threat that's up against him. And it's not an adversary per se, it's the potential of a future adversary. Someone who wants to take his throne. Someone who wants to rule. Someone who's maybe not as kind and benevolent as he is. Someone maybe uncouth. Someone perhaps who wants to destroy and ravage. Someone who could enjoy this alternate world that they're living in, perhaps to the same level of power that our boy Ein Zul Gaon is, except maybe he's not as nice. Maybe he doesn't view these NPCs as humans and he views them as NPCs. Maybe he's someone that is actually posing a threat to these people that Ein Zul Gaon is starting to appreciate as actual living creatures. The introduction of this artifact is done in an incredibly great way. It makes you see exactly how powerful Shaltir Bloodfallen is and exactly how dedicated Ainz Ulgaon is risking his own life to go up against her in an incredibly powerful final battle of the anime. Or at least the first season. Now, this isn't some kind of plot summary for Overlord. I'm only using these three arcs from the first season as examples, and I'll be mentioning a few more as we keep going. But we keep seeing these incredible, dominating displays of overpowering virtue from my boy Ainz here, while also showing you exactly how powerful he is. Ainz Ulgaon is one of the most thorough and consistently meticulous main characters I have ever seen in a story. I love meticulous characters because when people lose or, or get caught off guard by things that quite frankly they shouldn't have, it just makes me upset. So despite him being clearly overpowered and clearly a completely other level than everyone else he's bumping into, bro, this man goes up against an actual army, right? Literal army of people. And he summons these giant goat monsters with bunches of mouths and they eat the entire army like a vacuum cleaner going up against ants. He is a completely other level. So yes, while he does have the massive power moments where you just are reminded by his absolute majesty, they are sprinkled between other character moments where you start to see him really ponder and think about what threat could be posed to him? What threat could be posed to his people? What threat could be posed in this world that would cause un paralleled strife and imbalance to strike now that there are other people, other beings with these incredible powers in this world just like he is that he just isn't aware of yet. The first arc in the second season, or the following arc to what I've just mentioned, is the Lizardman Heroes arc. It's an arc that's pretty much not about the main dudes at all. Obviously, it's from the perspective of one of the generals, because that's kind of the gimmick that the story cards starts going through. You start to learn about all of Einzul Gaon's generals, because they are each their own fully fleshed out, fully realized characters in this world, with their whole backstories and their life cycles and their different species that has their own struggles and their own allegiances, but they have put all that aside for the greater good, or for whatever reason, to join our boy Einzul Gaon in his conquest. They each have their own reasons why they are doing what they're doing, and they have their own people that they've come from. We start to see them from their own perspective as their own characters, their own struggles, and they, unlike their boss, is not uh, immortal. They can be defeated. I mean, it's unlikely, realistically. They're incredibly overpowered in their own right, and they each have their own full overpowered done right arcs, especially Albedo. Like, goddamn, Albedo, you, f you freaking legend, you. Which also plays really well into Ainz Ul Gaon's struggles. What comes first? The, the happiness of his general? The ethics and morals and virtues that he actually has in regards to keeping balance or keeping people safe? Realistically, that, that's not that high on his list. He, he kills a lot of fucking people. <laughs> Incredibly based of him, I would do it if, if Twitter people were real. But suddenly the dilemmas that face him are his decisions more than even whether he will defeat his opponents because yeah, he, he will defeat his opponents. The Lizardman Heroes arc is an entire arc about Lizardmen. 
these people that are like not even related to freaking anybody and they're having their own arc and they're, they're these different lizard men worried about their tribes getting wiped out for one reason or another whether or not they are freaking virtuous enough that are they going to submit to this tyrannical reign of this undead overlord guy or are they going to keep their freaking world going their their politics going smoothly then we have this whole episode about two lizard men having sex and having lizard men babies like we, we, why do we need that and the answer is really simple, because Overlord is not about Eins Ul Gaon's power. Overlord is about how the citizens of this world deal with the power of this incredible Overlord. It is more relatable to relate to the incredibly oppressed lower class of society in Overlord than it is to relate to the actual Overlord. The guy that you'd think is the self-insert isekai character that everyone should be relating to. And slowly but surely, the arcs start developing the surrounding neighborhoods, the different areas, the different races and religions of this world so, so much, and how they deal with the fact that this terminally online overlord is ruling their every move and just incredibly powerful. The invaders of the large tomb arc is about these invent is about these worker guys who are exploring and investigating this mysterious tomb. What is going on in this mysterious tomb, which happens to be the headquarters of our boy, our god, our dude, our absolutely beautiful bone daddy? Goddamn, is he glorious in the Rule 34 Einzul gown himself? And well, they are trespassing in his domain, and he does not take this shit lightly. Suddenly, the world has to deal with the impending doom that this overlord can actually cause at any given moment, while this overlord is much more interested in exactly what could pose a threat to him at some point, and how he can ever get home. Between these arcs that I've mentioned, the Lizard Man arc and uh, the Invaders of the Tomb arc, <laughs> there's this Men in the Kingdom arc, where we learn about this entire re-Estes kingdom that's at war and with different rebellions going on. And of course, right after the Invaders of the Tomb arc, you have the Magic Caster of Destruction arc, which is a very long name for an arc, but it's also a major story arc about the annual war between the re-Estes kingdom that we learned so much about in the Baharuth kingdom. Now, of course, this is an annual thing going on between these kingdoms. They have this whole long legendary history going back forever about how they used to battle and their glory and the different nations and what they each possess. And everything changes because, well, Ein Ul Gaon and his new nation decide, hmm, we should join this annual war. <laughs> The arc that follows that, the Ruler of Conspiracy arc, is basically all about Ein Zul Gaon actually trying to turn his kingdom into utopia for all these races that he's slowly but surely allying with. He's actually trying to create a utopic area for everyone, an area of equality. This crazy, undead, overpowered overlord guy is trying to create a utopia and well, every other r freaking country does not like that idea because what the hell, man? If you make a utopia for all these races, then we have to all of a sudden have to give rights to our underdog classes and we hate doing that. We're all racist, fuck the nuts, guy. Well, we, we don't like this. And suddenly there's this massive war between the newly established Einzul Gaon nation and literally every other nation that wants to keep being a racist and, and rape and pillage and do all that fun shit. I feel like you're starting to realize exactly what I'm saying here. Einzul Gaon is an overpowered character done so right because his being overpowered isn't the actual main driving plot point of this story. This story is a world building masterclass and Einzul Gaon is the newly introduced super threat to how this world has operated until this point. There's a reason why a lot of people like antagonists. Antagonists shape a story. So you'll have your protagonist on his path to become the pirate king Hokage, doing whatever the fuck he, he normally decides to do, go to school and masturbate like every other person on the planet, and suddenly, be, due to an antagonist intervening that has some heinous evil shit plan, all of a sudden everything is, goes haywire, and the main character has to change because his parents were killed, and he must grow to become stronger and take revenge, and, and it's really the antagonist that shapes the story more often than not. If you look at basically Every single fantasy novel of the modern era, and I, I know it's kind of sad, there's a whole trope of how the main character is a humble farm boy, a farm boy with nothing to do. He'll raise goats in his older age and make his father proud. But because of the evil dark lord, suddenly the wizard has to call him the chosen one and pull him out of his shackles and, and start becoming this overpowered evil dude. Right, right? That, that, that's basically every single fantasy book that comes out today. I, I'm sorry. Happened to Luke Skywalker, happened to Frodo Baggins, and all of a sudden everyone was like, holy shit, let's jump on this fuck. It's always because of some 
alternate force that creates the course of the protagonist. That That is just basic storytelling. It doesn't always hold true, obviously. That That is definitely, obviously not always true. But when it comes to especially a self-insert character, more often than not, they're trying to give you that. Because you are just a simple farm boy on the farm with a boring life. And one day, maybe something will change. And now you can relate to this dude who was just your simple dude, and all of a sudden, he's this incredibly overpowered chosen one dude going up against the evil demon lord god guy. I, like, I mean, that's just pretty, pretty basic stuff. But suddenly you realize every character in this show that's not Einzelgaun is the boy on the farm. Einzelgaun is the threat. And even though he's the protagonist in the story and we are looking at the story from his perspective, he is the one shaping and shaking the power balances of this world. He is the one that is causing every climactic event to go on on a political level throughout Igudereshiri. It's not just a simple course of the protagonist shaped by how the antagonists attack them. He is the one shaping the world. As far as overpowered characters go, Ein's Ulgaon is a complete novelty in this field, where his power is so much more eminent with how it affects the daily lives and daily politics of every surrounding nation on this goddamn planet than how it affects uh, how he will overcome his next obstacle. It hurts my heart to see people shitting on Overlord because Overlord is just your generic isekai anime where your main character got trapped in a world and is overpowered and he just completely overpowers everyone. Man, there's no challenges. Bro is so strong he just fucking annihilates everyone. He can stretch the asshole of everyone he decides to. And aside from just the incredibly colorful cast, the really dynamically written, incredibly thought out characters, from Albedo to Demiurge to Pandora's actor, an underrated, beautiful man. I love Pandora's actor. He might even be my favorite character in the entire show. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I love that dude. Just such a beautifully written cast, such a beautifully fleshed out world. And my favorite part of it all is how they wrote an overpowered character that never makes a story feel stale which is the biggest and most blatant flaw in writing Overpowered, because the story isn't about how will he overcome his next battle. The story is how will the world change because of this one bony, horny man. Yeah, I know Einzul Gaon and Overlord isn't like actually popping right now, and if I was smart, I would make this incredibly long character analysis just on when the anime's airing to get more views, but to be honest, I'm the pettiest motherfucker on the internet, and if someone's gonna tell me that he's a shitty character, I'm gonna make an entire video to just prove him wrong without even mentioning his name. Like, like, like the fucking petty overlord that I am, alright? So definitely subscribe and, and stay weird, fam.